Um, I'm looking forward to hearing all about NOx, satellite-based NOx emission estimates for urban planning. Our first panelist is going to be Daniel Go Goldberg. So why don't you go ahead and take it away? I'm looking forward to it. So thank you. Thank you all for coming to this session. Um, I'm going to be discussing how we're using satellite data, NO2 satellite data for urban planning. This is part of the, uh, one of the HACAS Tiger teams. I'd like to thank um, uh, PIs from five, five of the PIs, uh, as well as a lot of their research groups. Um, a lot of work has gone in so far, even though we're only about four months into this project. So what is the team scope for this TIGER team. Um, there are remaining uncertainties in urban NOx emission estimates despite improvement over the past decade or so. Um, th there are uncertainties for mobile emissions such as vehicles, uh, uh, both passenger vehicles and diesel vehicles, but there's also large uncertainties from other sectors such as warehouses, construction, residential, landscaping, shipping, recreational marine, et cetera. Um, these have very large uncertainties, so satellite data to the rescue. This is, of course, tongue in cheek. Um, but there, there are some new satellites uh, instruments, uh, Tropomi, that has been discussed a little bit already. This has improved spatial resolution compared to prior instruments. And they also have high resolution models, um, four kilometer or sometimes one kilometer resolution, which you'll hear about a little bit later, which allow us to glean information at local scales. We can also use these models and satellites to estimate um, what's going on at the intra-urban scale. So what's going on near major highways or ports, airports, or large point sources within the city. This has consistently been a high priority from uh, stakeholders. So what does satellite data look like, specifically NO2 satellite data? Um, this is a single day about uh, a week and a half ago um, showing uh, column amounts of NO2 in the Northeastern United States. We can see um, first of all, these are measurements between the surface and about 40,000 feet or 12 kilometers in altitude. Uh, most, uh, but not all, of the NO2 is near the surface in urban areas, and uh, there's missing data due to both clouds and thick uh, snow cover. Uh, very clearly, you can see all the major cities in the northeastern United States, with the exception of Boston, where there's clouds there. Um, and uh, yeah, you can start to see all a lot of different power plants. But what's also nice to do is to average them out to annual concentrate, annual amounts. So this is uh, 2019, and we see a lot of the same major cities now, but we can also start to really pinpoint individual point sources, such as some of the, uh, let's see if you can see my pointer here, some of the power plants in West Virginia and in um, South Central uh, Pennsylvania, in addition to this, actually some, some fractions Lancaster County. Um, but uh, yeah, it's really nice that you can start to see a lot of these, the spatial heterogeneity. And this is the type of data that's gonna be most relevant for our team when we compare to NOx emissions directly. Um, so I processed recently uh, urban NOx emissions, uh, sorry, urban NOx estimates. Um, here is uh, NO2, uh, from Tropomi um, directly, you can see for 32 different areas, 30 cities and two oil and gas regions. Um, this is tropospheric column NO2 from Tropomi average over the year. And uh, in the bottom right of each panel is the um, average amount in uh, the downtown area and choose the city that's closest to you. I'm not gonna go through all of these, um, but we can see uh, 2019 through 2021, um, 2019 was generally the largest, 2020 was generally the smallest, and then 2021 actually is a little bit mixed. So in some areas it was in between um, uh, 2019 and 2020, in some cities it's actually the lowest of the three years. So um, this is an ongoing uh, investigation as to what's going on in each city, and often cases the story is a little bit uh, different for each city. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of this uh, uh, talk is to, to take a look at individual cities and trying to answer questions that stakeholders have raised. Um, so one stakeholder question has been an ongoing stakeholder question for, for many years, I believe, is how do NOx emissions vary on small spatial scales and how do these match to the satellite data um, and, and what is really going on in reality? So um, previously, many uh, simulations were conducted at 12 kilometers spatial resolution 
This is okay if you're trying to get ozone concentrations uh, because ozone is generally a little bit more homogeneous than, than NO2. Uh, but if we really want to look at NOx emissions directly, it's really helpful to start looking at high spatial resolution. So George uh, Mason University has taken a, has done a lot of work trying to uh, uh, disaggregate or, or get very high resolution NOx emissions. And so here are just two examples of Washington, D.C. and Houston. And so we're going to ultimately compare this with uh, Trobomi NO2. Uh, another project looking at Chicago and some other Midwestern cities is looking at how uh, tropomy can be used to estimate NO2 in between the monitors. So here's on the left hand side, I'm showing um, a simple correlation between tropomy, which is on the X axis of each panel, and uh, the AQS monitors on the Y. And uh, this is actually done by Gage Kerr. Sorry, I forgot to put your name on here. Um, but Gage Kerr uh, was able to um, take a look and saw that the R squared values are about 0.7. Um, and so that's that's actually really great agreement between um, Tropomi and these monitors directly without any type of uh, machine learning. And so once we do do some type of machine learning, which is on the right panel here, uh, we get R squareds closer to 0.9. And here's an estimate of Chicago uh, not surprisingly, the largest amounts of NO2 using this machine learning algorithm is just south of the city in the, what's called the Dan Ryan Express, Expressway, but also north of the city, north um, west of the city near O'Hare Airport. So not, a, not surprising. And this is ongoing work, very preliminary, um, uh, very preliminary research coming out of our group. Uh, let's take a look at Atlanta. Here's uh, a, a picture of um, a comparison between Tropome and CMEC. CMEC is a regional chemical transport model. A stakeholder question was how are the NOx emissions near the airport affecting the ozone non-attainment region? And um, very clearly you can see that NO2 is largest in the metropolitan area near the Atlanta airport. Um, and so what uh, Ted Russell and his group at, at Georgia Tech have done is they've really taken a look, a very close look at the emissions near the airport. They've done a better job at, at allocating these emissions and they get slightly better agreement between this, the, the model and the satellite. But as you can see, this is the improved version of CMAC. You can see there's still a little bit of disagreement near the airport and that's what we're gonna hope to further work on over the coming year or so. Um, on the right-hand panel is uh, work by Dr. Jen Kaiser. Um, showing, um, actually, this is, uh, I believe, a, 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 what's called a GAM, a, a regression model, um, and uh, using uh, Tropomi as an input, but also some aviation and traffic data. And she was able to show that a lot of the decreases during the uh, early parts of the lockdowns were due to both aviation and traffic. And this is near the airport. So you can't underestimate all the idling vehicles and all of the transportation in and out of the airport when um, trying to disentangle what's going on near airports. Um, another question near Los Angeles uh, was what's going on near both Long Beach and the warehouse uh, area. Uh, this The warehousing district, which is in the Inland Empire, I'll show that in the map in a second. Um, and we can see during uh, the fall of 2020, uh, there was a very large decrease compared to the two prior falls. And this is, this is in, uh, uh, shown on the left-hand panel here. Um, and we can see that there were increases at Long Beach Port and also in the Inland Empire over here, uh, San Bernardino, where there are a, a lot of warehouses being built. Um, if we, and there's also a wildfire uh, influence in north of the city. Um, if we take a look at 2021, um, actually very similar patterns are occurring where there's a decrease in downtown LA, but increase near Long Beach, increase in the England Empire, and actually an increase in Orange County and uh, we're southeast of LA, and this is still ongoing. But very clearly there's an increase in 2021 you know, the port compared to prior years. And that's, that's certainly concerning for communities that live uh, downwind of these of the port activities. And one last example is New York City of, of, we actually had a paper come out recently showing how the NO2 fluctuated during the lockdowns before, during and after the lockdowns. And uh, we saw about a 30% drop 
in NOx emissions in 2020 compared to prior compared to 2018. That's the black line here. This is OMI. And if we take compare this 2018 value to what I calculated for 2021, there's about a 14% drop. So very preliminary work, but we're trying to estimate what this quote unquote new normal is for NOx emissions in cities. So going forward, um, we wanna have continued conversations with stakeholders. We're looking to expand our reach. Um, we are going to disseminate some NO2 shape files and NOx emission estimates to urban planners. Uh, we're going to compare trope OMI and OMI to gridded NOx emissions directly. And we're going to use some model information where available. For example, Atlanta is one, but we have many other. We'll, we'll, we'll hear from Alex in a, in a minute or two about uh, New York City as a go between between NO2 and NOx. Uh, we can uh, estimate NOx spatial uncertainties in select cities. Arlene Fiore is going to. Uh, Arlene Fiore's group is gonna try this for New York City. If you were at the last session, she discussed that, that method a little bit. Um, we're also developing a website with near real-time Tropomi NO2 that can be easily interpreted by all. I have a, a beta site that I'm happy to share. Uh, we're also gonna have some explainers describing some of these methods. So we're willing to shift our focus a bit based on stakeholder feedback. Um, this is the stakeholder list that I have. If you are interested in giving us some feedback, uh, obviously today is a great time, but also via email, you can scan the, the QR code in the top right to, to send me an email, or you can scan the one at the bottom to follow me on Twitter and you can ask me questions or follow me there. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a really exciting talk. I, I enjoyed it. And uh, I, I hope that we have some questions later because this is an interesting topic. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will get to them after we've heard from all our speakers. Our next speaker is going to see, be James East from North Carolina State. Um, I don't see the slides yet. Who, who is, um, okay. Looks like we're getting them up. All right, can you uh, see the slides now? We see the slides and we hear you, so please take it away. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, as Amber said, my name is James East and um, I'm a ORISE research fellow at the US EPA and a PhD candidate at NC State University. And um, first off, I'd like to thank Tracy and Jenny and everyone who helped organize this um, and uh, made this opportunity. And um, today I'm gonna be talking about applying OMI and TROPOMI NO2 observations in the EPA modeling framework. And this project um, and the research I'm going to be talking about is um, teamwork between the US EPA and um, several folks there, as well as NC State. And it actually started as a, a HACAS Tiger team. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, before I get into the details of the research project itself, I want to give a broad overview of how satellite data is has been used regularly and um, is uh, continues to be used regularly at EPA. And this slide was contributed by my colleague, Baron Henderson at the EPA. And I'm not gonna uh, maybe go into every bullet point, but what you can see here is that there's a lot of different ways that satellite data is currently used at the EPA. One of the biggest ways um, is relating to the model. So um, inputs to the modeling system at EPA and also um, used frequently to evaluate the model. And there's multiple ongoing projects right now um, where uh, satellite data, either for evaluation or for emissions, plays a big part, a uh, big role in, in those projects. To sort of zoom in on, on one uh, quick example before I get into the uh, research project, which is the main um, thing I'm going to be talking about, I want to share an example of when, um, in, when EPA scientists were putting together the 2016 um, hemispheric modeling platform, they uh, needed to choose the best emissions to represent NOx emissions over China. And two of the NOx emissions data set uh, that they were looking at showed sort of diverging trends in NOx emissions over China. And using trends in satellite observed NO2, um, as it was reflected in the literature with some references here, they chose the emissions data set, which showed um, lower NOx emissions and a steeper decrease in NOx emissions after 2010. And uh, later updates to the SEDS uh, uh, global emissions inventory 
sort of confirmed that choice. And so this is just an example of when uh, quantitative trends um, as viewed by the satellites were helped used to inform a qualitative decision. So now moving into um, my research and, and the research that's ongoing at EPA right now um, in a policy relevant modeling context um, is about uh, using NO2 from satellites and assimilating it into the modeling platform. And I wanna give some sort of quick motivation for why we would wanna do this in, uh, in the sort of policy relevant context, the, the regional model, which models the United States as well as um, sort of around the United States um, is used for, um, in, in the policy relevant context. But this model uses boundary conditions from a hemispheric model. But to run, to run that, we need emissions uh, for the entire Northern hemisphere. But these emissions can be delayed in time and they can have a lot of uncertainty. And so um, NO2 observed from space through the OMI and TROPOMI and other satellites provides the opportunity to bridge this gap in time and constrain some of these uncertain um, international emissions. So by implementing data assimilation into the EPA modeling framework, we can take advantage um, of those observations within the modeling itself. So this project grew out of a tiger team. Um, the, the PIs for that tiger team were Brad Pierce and Daniel Tong. And um, I'll just say that, you know, they, there was a technology transfer of the data assimilation system to EPA. And we've continued to work uh, with the PIs um, as we adapt the platform. And that collaboration has been very important and very helpful uh, for this research. Uh, now I'll get into a little bit of sort of actually how we do the emissions refinement. And so the, the main takeaway here is that the result is that what we get is um, updated 2019 NOx emissions uh, for the Northern hemisphere that are constrained by either OMI NO2 observations or TROPOMI NO2 observations. Um, and we do this through what's called a finite difference mass balance. Um, but essentially how that works is that we have an assimilation system which fuses the satellite observed NO2 with the modeled NO2. When we fuse that, uh, we can use that uh, difference that that creates in the model to estimate a change in NOx emissions. And we, we iterate this so we can kind of converge and get a, an answer, so to speak, of, of the NOx emissions that we're looking for. One of the challenges that we've encountered and one of the sort of new things about our approach that where we try to decrease some of the biases is that as other folks have mentioned in the meeting earlier today, when uh, the satellites only view the total column of NO2 and so they don't distinguish where in the column NO2 is happening. And as Dan mentioned a second ago, most of that's near the surface in polluted areas, but we don't know for sure. The model on the other hand, um, it has three dimensional, it's a three dimensional model and so it has different levels. So uh, it's a challenge to distribute the satellite NO2 to the model levels. And so we um, have, we do a method here to sort of cut off um, and only focus on the bottom layer um, or, or near the near surface increment. And we hope to get rid of some of the biases from the upper troposphere that way. Um, oops, looks like okay. So um, once we fuse the satellite NO2 data with the model data, we get uh, something that looks like this on the left. So what we're looking at is, um, it's called the analysis increment or the, the, the change from fusing the, the satellite with the model for OMI and TROPOMI in four seasons. And then once we put that into our iterative, iterative framework that I just showed, we can calculate emissions updates for these major regions. And, and something that sticks out right away is that OMI in, uh, in general leads to higher emissions increments than TROPOMI, which tends to decrease our prior emissions. Um, and some of those changes would be expected from our prior, um, but some of these, you know, we wanna kind of learn what's going on. But something else to note is that the prior emissions sort of fall in between um, OMI and, and TROPOMI in both cases. Now, uh, so we wonder where this difference comes from, uh, but the, the difference between these two satellites is a known thing. And it's been noted by, by others that uh, TROPOMI tends to be lower than OMI. So you can see um, here on the right side, I'm showing the, you know, if, if, uh, if you're familiar with the satellite products, I'm showing the vertical column on the top and the slant column on the bottom. And just to show that um, OMI for the vertical column is larger than TROPOMI for, for the analysis period that we're looking at, 
And then in the slant column, at least over the United States, that's true as well. And so we wonder, you know, uh, what does this impact on our NOx inversion? And we see that it's large, but, um, or, or it, it, that it's there. But there's sort of two, two main points to take away here. And one is that the, um, there are currently ongoing reprocessing efforts um, to create consistency across satellite instruments and across years uh, for, for NO2 and for other pollutants. And that these efforts are uh, very important for, um, for modelers and for modeling efforts like this. And it helps us put these differences and these changes into context. Um, and then another point is that tropomy, um, in response to uh, uh, noticing that the tropomy was lower, there's a, now a new reprocessed product available. So the results that I'm showing don't include, you know, weren't created with this reprocessed product. And we expect that if we were to use that, that we would see a, um, a smaller difference between OMI and tropomy. But sort of understanding this helps put our results in context. Then finally, to get back to the motivation uh, for why we would want to be doing this, I mentioned that the, the hemispheric scale model provides boundary conditions to the regional scale model. And that's important because of um, long range uh, transport of pollutants that can be transported um, around the northern hemisphere. And so I've zoomed in here on the Pacific Ocean and you can see that when we use uh, either OMI or tropomi, that leads to changes in the amount of ozone being transported across the Pacific Ocean and impacting North America. And that's a sort of non-trivial change between these two satellites, uh, the two sort of updated emissions inventories that we've created. And so understanding where the satellite um, data is different helps us put these differences in the context so that we can choose the uh, posterior emissions or the emissions product with the updated emissions that, that works best um, in any given situation. And it's also kind of a, I think a lesson for us to not use uh, in any uh, exercise like this, to not use any one product, but uh, looking at both of them helps us put the uh, results in the context. Then to, to finish up, I'll just uh, briefly show this slide that uh, the results I've showed up to now have been on the hemispheric scale, which unlike the results that Dan just showed, which were very uh, fine scale, the hemispheric scale is very coarse, but we can apply this assimilation system uh, on, on the finer scale regional model. And we've started to do that for I'm trying to list those in the Elmas domains here. And so that opens up the door for a lot of opportunities. And so with that, I'll uh, hand it off to the next speaker and um, just uh, say thank you for uh, joining this session. Thank you very much. It looks like we have 74 participants right now. Um, and our next speaker, if you could go ahead and load your slides or whoever's controlling those, is Alexandra Karambalas. Excuse me if I've messed up your name. Can't wait to hear it the real way. And please do put your questions in the Q&A. looks like we, this is a healthy session. Thanks a lot. And Alexandra, if you're ready, did you want to take it away? I don't hear Sorry. you yet. I was trying are. to find okay. the mute, unmute. Um, so we haven't been doing this for two years, right? Uh, it, it doesn't uh, look like you're in the full screen mode. You're perfect. Um, in the, the viewer mode. Fabulous. How about now? Okay, great. Perfect. Okay, awesome. So uh, thank you very much for that introduction. My name is Alex Carambellis. I am an environmental analyst at NESCOM, the Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management. Um, just making sure that we can all see the screen. We're good to go. Um, so NESCOM uh, provides scientific, technical, and policy support for our uh, member states across the Northeastern United States. Um, and we also provide support for uh, the Ozone Transport Commission, which a lot of my modeling work intersects and overlaps with. Um, and so uh, today I'm going to specifically be talking about uh, wharf CMAC modeling on high ozone days. So a little bit of motivation for um, the modeling that I've been conducting uh, at NASCOM is in support of LISTOS, the Long Island Sound Tropospheric Ozone Study. LISTOS was a multi-institutional uh, field campaign in 2018 um, to achieve numerous things, including a better understanding of key VOC species, improving temporal and spatial resolution of NOx emissions in the Long Island Sound area, uh, compare mobile source emissions to moves estimates, um, direct measurements of pollution, pollutant uh, transport and marine mixing layer across the Long Island Sound. Um, as you, I don't know if we can see 
my little cursor, um, but going, uh, we can see that there were significant uh, observations captured across the entire region, um, uh, as well as the flexibility to seize other opportunities that may arise, including several uh, sites that spawned off of Listos um, following the campaign, such as a mobile ozone LIDAR, special, several special monitoring sites, um, and collection of formaldehyde uh, VOC and BCP measurements. Um, and so one of the reasons Listos was a very valuable field campaign was because ozone still poses a significant problem in the region. And um, part of where the modeling comes in is that uh, it's this were, uh, there are still difficulties in uh, modeling coastal regions. Um, so just briefly, some of my uh, modeling research questions. This modeling, these questions were structured to help uh, inform our states and help uh, derive strategies to help reduce um, ozone pollution in the region, and whether that's targeting a specific emission sector or just helping to get a better picture. Um, so some of the modeling uh, that we're targeting includes um, addressing questions related to if typical meteorological and air quality modeling parameters um, can actually adequately represent coastal conditions. Uh, investigating how NOx and VOC emissions play a role in ozone formation and concentrations in the region. Thinking about the extent to which NOx emissions inventories and scaling choices impact ozone concentrations. And then digging in to see if higher resolution modeling is uh, produces better agreement with in situ and remotely sensed observations. And as we saw from the, the previous slide, there are a significant amount of observations for us to uh, evaluate our model with. So just a brief overview of the modeling tools. I used a coupled wharf CMAC uh, uh, setup uh, at a 1.33 kilometer by 1.33 kilometer resolution. And we can see what that um, domain looks like in the thumbnail in the upper right. Uh, inputs come from our collaborators at the EPA, including meteorology emissions that were uh, scaled to 2018 from um, various uh, earlier inventories or uh, reflective of um, 2018 uh, EGU emissions and things of that nature, um, as well as initial and boundary conditions. Um, the main work that I'll be presenting in the next five and a half minutes are uh, some sensitivity testing that we're running in collaboration with the Ozone Transport Commission Modeling Committee um, in terms of fine tuning the model simulations in the region, specifically swapping out the standard IPM EGU electricity generating unit emissions and uh, swapping in those from ERTAC. So jumping right into that, um, these are difference plots. And so we're really trying to get a sense of how do different emissions inventories affect um, ozone and ozone precursors. So the differences here are WARF CMAC with ERTAC minus WARF CMAC with um, IPM. So, or that the standard um, EGU emissions inventory. So our differences are pretty localized in both monthly average NO2 and monthly average maximum daily eight hour ozone. No real consistent changes across the entire domain. Um, we do see that there are uh, consistent between NO2 versus ozone in that we have, if we have um, higher instances of NO2, like in the heart of New York City, we see that there is a little bit more titration. And so we lose a little bit of ozone, which is kind of for the best, but comp uh, contradictory and uh, compli complicated with uh, 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 nonlinearities. Um, but overall, this can, can kind of give us a sense of how uh, the big picture of how these emissions inventories affect um, ozone, even if you're modifying just one um, specific sector. And it's important to consider how these uh, changes impact uh, concentrations as they are evaluated with observations. And so here I've just chosen um, four observation sites, uh, two near New York City and New Jersey, and two downwind um, representative more of the, the coastal Long Island um, region. And our observations are in blue. Uh, that base case model simulation is in red. And if you can see the bright green pops, those are the uh, concentrations of 
the daily concentrations of maximum daily eight hour ozone uh, with the ERTAC implement, uh, inventory implemented. And generally we see that the model, the two model simulations are not terribly different um, and they both pretty well replicate day-to-day -day variability across all four of these sites. Um, we do note that the uh, both, both iterations of the model simulation um, and especially with the ERTAC emissions, we get a little bit of a higher overestimate um, in some of these August days. Sorry, it's a cut off a little bit, um, but we get some of that a little bit of an overestimate. Um, and so this um, uh, leads us to, uh, or, or helps us understand that there's a little bit more um, analysis and digging to do to understand uh, why we might be seeing these overestimates um, at these downwind uh, observation sites. So one question that we keep asking ourselves, especially in conjunction with our HACAS collaborators, is can we tease out any patterns on um, that, that occur in ozone on non-exceedance versus exceedance days? Um, and so taking um, a cue from our uh, HACAS collaborators at Columbia University uh, in this table on the right, we can parse out non-exceedance and exceedance days, those non-exceedance days. The non-exceedance days are in green, the exceedance days are in orange. We further simplify these comparisons um, by only extracting the days that correspond to um, the aircraft formaldehyde and NO2 observations um, as indicated by the slash. And so these are taking, uh, I believe these are five days each in July and August um, across our uh, model output. And we see that there are pretty significant differences in the average um, non-exceedance versus exceedance ozone concentrations. Um, on the left is that non-exceedance average, on the right is the um, exceedance average. And uh, it's kind of what we expected to see, that you would get higher incidence of exceedance um, ozone concentrations in urban areas, um, but I think what was a little shocking, at least to me, was that the maximum difference was more than 20 parts per billion. Um, so well beyond uh, uh, in these urban centers, the concentration, max concentrations on these exceedance days are well beyond um, the 70 parts per billion national ambient air quality standard. So bringing us back to the specific changes that we've been trying to introduce, we can see what occurs on non-exceedance averages versus exceedance average conditions um, by swapping in those emissions inventories. And it's pretty similar to what we saw um, on average conditions, um, but trying to, but we wanted to try to dig in and see if there were any patterns between non-exceedance and exceedance days. Generally what we see in here and as well as in um, looking at uh, other model changes that we introduce the biggest changes come about on our non-exceedance days that rather than our exceedance days. So more things added to our list to investigate. And then finally, um, again, with, our, with uh, the help of our HACAS collaborators, we're just, this is my last slide, we're just um, uh, comparing these, uh, our FNR outputs uh, from the model uh, output with those from um, aircraft observations and tropomy. And we see that there are some pretty uh, interesting differences in that there's not necessarily a tightening in the NOx saturation regime, but a shift and a broadening in the model. So lots of things to kind of parse out. And I apologize for going over time. Uh, oh, that was hard to, to get off of that. Thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. And now we have one more uh, final speaker. And just a reminder to put any questions you have in the Q&A. And thank you for loading that, Tracy. Our next speaker is, our, is uh, Tracy Holloway uh, from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. And uh, this is our final talk for this session. And then we can really get to the discussion of questions. Um, Tracy, you can take it away when you're ready. Okay, well, thank you, Amber, and thank you to all the speakers in the session so far. It's been really uh, fun to hear what each of you are working on and uh, look forward to the panel discussion. Um, so uh, I'm talking today about the work of my team at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. 
And um, this is the work that was supported by our HeyCast grant. And I just want to make a shout out to some of the co-investigators and collaborators who I'll be mentioning over the course of this talk. Um, but I'm working with uh, Anna Prados, who's now at Battelle, uh, Jonathan Patz, who uh, is on the global health side, Brad Pierce, who's the collaborator that James mentioned working with the EPA, and um, as well as Barron and Kirk, uh, especially through Brad's work, but also through other projects. I'm also working with the American Lung Association, uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute, and Ramble in different, in different ways. So when the work that I've been doing in my research group is very much motivated by uh, my interest in HACAST as a whole, which is basically how can we broaden the use of satellite data by new organizations and deepen its use and impact in the organizations that are already using satellite data. And we have a very wide diversity of organizations that have been interested in our work. This, the NASA investment in ACAST began in 2011, and then it was focused on US air quality, which basically referred to the EPA and state agencies because the Clean Air Act very much constrains air quality within the United States. But in 2016, it was broadened to include health, the H in, in HACAST, and that opens up the door to connect with health organizations, with nonprofits, with uh, energy groups interested in health and climate, and you know, just uh, a much broader uh, in size and scope. And it also paves the way to for a lot of the work that is going on now with environmental justice. And so recognizing the, the, the diversity of potential applications and stakeholders and the diversity of perspectives with respect to NASA data. Some of our stakeholders like um, Alex, who just spoke, is technically a stakeholder since she's working with uh, NESCOM. But she's been, she has a PhD and has been supported uh, by NASA Applied Sciences activities um, for a lot of her career, which I was really uh, pleased to have the opportunity to work with her. So our stakeholders are coming from a lot of different perspectives as well. And over time, you know, I've kind of thought about four different levels of engagement with NASA science. And sometimes it moves starting with one up to uh, higher levels or lower levels, whichever direction uh, you want. Um, but other times, you know, folks just come in at different levels. And I want to talk now about the work that we've been doing in my research group to address uh, activities kind of at all of these four levels, with the first being, what is NASA data? Kind of trying to get users curious, aware. Um, a lot of, of organizations may not have heard of satellite data to support air quality issues. And that's becoming less true now. It was much more true 10 years ago. But the, the awareness building is sort of step one. Uh, step two is uh, for organizations that are aware that it exists, does it really align with the mission of their organization? And I kind of called that the engaged level. And then, you know, once they see that it may be worth their time, then getting active with using it and finally uh, becoming expert and using it within their organization. And so some of the work that we've been doing to uh, build awareness of what is, uh, what NASA data are, what they can be used for, how to use satellite data. What we found for um, any issue related to urban air quality uh, is usually satellite NO2 is the natural starting point. And in fact, you know, over time, I've started referring to all the NO2 products as really the darling of air quality applications because um, satellites do a good job detecting NO2. We have three satellites orbiting that detect air over North America, four if you add in the GEMS instrument over uh, Asia. And, um, and there's some really compelling results, as we've heard from our speakers already in this session. So um, for most organizations who are curious about satellite data, the very first um, data product that I tell them about is NO2. And um, what I'm showing here is just a comparison of when the overpass times occur for the GOM-2 instrument, which is the coarsest orbiting instrument right now, um, which passes over in the morning, and then the OMI instrument and trope OMI, which pass over later in the afternoon. And the lines show um, average ground level NO2 at monitoring um, from urban areas in red 
suburban in yellow and rural in green. And urban areas consistently have the highest NO2 um, and it also has a very strong diurnal cycle. Um, so some of the work that I've been doing to, to broaden awareness of satellite data has been writing like a paper I wrote for Environmental Manager and a review article for the annual reviews of biomedical data science, uh, participating in an issue brief earlier this year and trying to engage with the media. So um, basically anytime a reporter calls me to talk about satellite data, I am always happy to do it. And I am not above using cute pictures of my children to um, get the word out as well. So um, the next um, layer at once people know that satellite data exists is can it be useful to my organization? And I would say that the one of the kind of greatest hits coming out of the satellite NO2 applications has been to support evaluation of trends. And back in 2014, our HeyCast colleague, Brian Duncan was even on the CNN news showing satellite data of NO2 to um, discuss 10 year trends in air quality since the launch of the Aura satellite. And even now, if you're interested in looking at long-term trends, the OMI instrument remains your best bet, but TROPE-OMI has much higher resolution and is great for spatial patterns, impacts, and change since 2019. And actually Dan's results that he mentioned that he and Gage had been working on where trope only compares well with surface observations is really uh, amazing. I mean, I think that's a game changer. Um, and so that kind of work has one, been one of the things that has been um, getting us excited about our work with Dan's Tiger team for Knox, as well as Susan Annenberg's Tiger team for environmental justice. And just in the lower right, we were um, asked by the mayor's office of, of Madison, Wisconsin, to provide shape files of Trobomi NO2 in part to support their environmental justice and sustainability efforts. But we don't want to just send them the data. We want to be contextualizing it. Um, and that's why we're excited to work with uh, Dan and um, apply the same kind of um, comparison with surface observations that he showed over Chicago. Um, Another example of engaged uh, engagement with uh, satellite data is our work with the American Lung Association. And in that case, it is not related to NOx, but um, they're interested in satellite derived NO2, which is, I would say, definitely right up there with NO2 as one of the most useful satellite related products pertaining to air quality and health. And a couple of years ago, I um, collaborated with other uh, HACAS colleagues to compare, um, at the time, publicly available satellite uh, derived PM 2.5. And that's what's shown here. This is a paper that was published um, and the citation is there, but there's a lot of difference. And, I, and as methods have advanced, there's been a lot of convergence, but we're curious as to, you know, what are the differences between the current uh, currently available PM 2.5 data products and how can we analyze those in a way that supports the ALA. So that's one of the projects that we're working on now. Um, when we think about sort of the users who are ready to get going with satellite data, one of the things we've been trying with HeyCast is to make sure that, it's, that we're um, summoning all the resources in a way that makes sense and that helps people get going. And so if you're interested in using satellite data, we have on our um, HeyCast website, a tools and resources section, you can get started tools, downloading data and tutorials. And one thing we found from a lot of the existing web platforms is that there's a trade off between focused and easy to use versus flexible and more difficult to use. So um, finding the right balance for stakeholders on what kind of engagement they want is one of the um, things we do through conversations, but also we try to do through the way we present options on our website. In my research group, one thing we've found over the years is that many stakeholders want satellite data on a grid that they can compare with their models or a grid that can be turned into a shape file or a grid that can be compared with ground-based monitors, just a grid. So we uh, developed the Wisconsin Horizontal Interpolation Pro uh, Program for Satellites or um, WHIPS because it whips your data into shape. And we've also uh, gridded data at a 12 kilometer by 12 kilometer resolution from OMI going back to 2005. So those gridded data files are available on the website given here. 
And coming soon are gridded tropomy files, shape files, sulfur dioxide, and NO2, and anything that you request. So we're ready to help make the data as useful as possible to you. Um, an example of how we're trying to use satellite data in collaboration with a um, stakeholder is our work with the Rocky Mountain Institute. They're interested in, sat in building NOx, and we're going to see whether we see the signature of, bu of building heating on cold days. And finally, you know, when you have an organization that's already integrating satellite data into its operations, the way the EPA is, and James really laid that out very nicely, um, uh, that's wonderful. And there's lots of examples for NO2, from model evaluation to looking at trends, ozone sensitivity, like Alex mentioned, uh, and other examples from the health and um, emissions worlds as well. And in that case, one of the things we want to do with HACAST, and one of the things that I'm doing and, and really my role is helping to uh, document and share those successes. And we've been excited to be part of some of the how-tos. And I think one that's often cited as a real success story came out of uh, Arlene Fiore's uh, Tiger team uh, from the last generation of HeyCast that I um, was a co-author on and is now update on um, Brian Duncan's um, air quality website here, we're trying to provide guidance documents so that other organizations can learn from the success um, that has come out of our work. And so um, wherever you are on an organization here, it, we're happy to work with you. And if you're a scientist thinking about working with stakeholders, I think it is helpful to sort of think about where they are and where they want to be in their use of satellite data for their particular application. And so with that, I will close and look forward to uh, the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. That was really nice. I enjoyed the history and also the up-to-date analysis, and you really whipped that talk into shape. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we have a couple questions. Um, the first one starts, uh, goes to Alex, and that is, are the EGU emissions in CMAQ at the surface or at some altitude, or at summit altitude? Curious if emissions height might play a role in the ozone responses you see when you switch inventories. Yes, um, our uh, EGU inventories are um, processed in the model at elevation, uh, various elevations. Um, so that would definitely play a role. And so I appreciate the question and now we'll add it to my list of things to investigate. <laughs> Good job. Um, and the next question is, is the menu of options for ALA also available for other groups to use? Yes, it will be for sure. We're gonna put it on our website. Um, I think though, you know, what we're, we're trying to do now is, is have those discussions to make sure that we're pulling everything together. Because for example, there's communities that are using um, satellite derived PM 2.5 over California um, that may not be aware of analogous pro pro products for the Eastern US. And the organizations that like Randall Martin is really the world leader in developing global data sets and you know, he gave us some other examples of, of data products that we should be comparing with on a global basis, um, but he may not be aware of everything that's happening at the state or regional scale. So we're trying to kind of use the network that Haycast has developed and you know, the expertise across our team and these Tiger teams as well to um, make sure that, you know, we may still be missing something, to be honest, but we're doing our best to pull it all together, to compare it, to explain how the data products are different and to pull them all into a common GIS framework so that they can be used easily because it's a, it would be a shame for a user to have to choose product A instead of product B, just because one of them was in the, the, a particular data format. I mean, the data formatting can be a real hassle and a barrier, but uh, you know that's one of the ways that we can make data more uh, accessible so that users can compare what's on the menu and uh, order something for takeout. <laughs> that's a good analogy. <laughs> 
So our, our next question is likely for Dan and James, but anybody can weigh in. And that's um, given the temporal, spectral, and vertical differences of tropomy and comparing to CMAC. So how does tropomy inform the EPA and CMAC in making decisions? So how do you take these two differences that, that you have shown and how do you know what's the right, how do you work that out with the EPA? Um, I can just say a couple words maybe, um, and then Dan, uh, if you have more thoughts, please chime in. Um, you know, one bullet that was on one of those slides is that um, the satellite data, um, I think the, the point earlier about how tropomy compared well and, and the efforts to compare tropomy to surface measurements are really interesting. Um, but in the EPA context, you know, that's um, the uh, not something that it's used for is to uh, be interpreted as surface, measure, as surface measurements. For the model context, um, it's really probably the biggest application is for evaluation. Um, and so um, anything from the Listos project, like Alex was talking about, I know there's a lot of scientists at EPA working on that to the large scale hemispheric um, scale projects. Uh, I, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll add a little bit. Um, I guess I, I think this is kind of a story of how um, NOx emissions have evolved over time. Um, in 10, 20 years ago, um, NOx emissions inventories were very uncertain. And so at that time frame, satellite data, anything from satellite data was super helpful in trying to discern what was going on. Um, especially outside the US, but even inside the US. And, and it wasn't even 10 years, about 10 years ago, there was a paper or a, a group that I was part of that saw, saw that the mobile emissions were off by about 50%. But now, now it seems like the NOx emissions inventories are getting better and better over time. And so, you know, small adjustments to the algorithms of, of satellite data um, can really make a big difference in whether your model is under predicting or over predicting NO2. So I think the, the it's getting harder and harder over time. And uh, in some sense, um, satellite data is great that it's you know getting higher and higher spatial resolution, but it also adds a, a layer of complexity. So I don't know if that's, <laughs> there, there's definitely a positive spin there where there's amazing satellite instruments, but there, there, there's, um, you know, it, it has to be interpreted uh, with care. I think that was a good follow-up. And I'm uh, thinking about, I'm wondering if um, if Alex wants to add anything about aircraft campaigns to and how they relate to the same question. All right, I find my unmute button again. Um, I think, I guess when I, when I try to think about, um, how, about all of these individual tools, I really think it's about integrating everything. And so having, um, additional uh, data sets to be able to cross validate and um, make sure that, you know, you're not, you know, overestimating, underestimating, you want to make sure that you're in the ballpark of what you're looking at. And so being able to um, uh, integrate different data sets together, um, adding multiple layers to things can be more helpful, even if it does complicate the, the, the question that you're trying to answer. Um, because you're really just providing more support and evidence for what you're finding. Um, so that's kind of how I like to think about it. Although I am a modeler by nature and that's an and experience. And so I'm always an advocate for, you know, using models, but they all come with caveats and uh, all these tools come with caveats, especially models. Um, so having more observations, I believe is, is kind of the best, the, the, the best approach. I also say this as a researcher who spent many years looking at air quality in India where there are very few observations. And so being able to um, have an abundance of them is really useful. Thanks for that addition, that was helpful. And we have a general question for the entire panel and that's, uh, do you have a preferred model or tool you would recommend for cities for, for measuring NOx or is it more about finding the right combination of tools and model for specific areas? Well, Al just 
jump in to say that, I mean, the question was about models, but I'll be broad that, you know, most cities don't have an NO2 monitor or only have one. And so, and most models cannot resolve urban scale changes in, in anything. So really tropomy to me is the, is the, um, tool in the toolbox that most directly addresses urban scale issues related from, from exposure to um, emissions. And I'll see if other people agree. Yes, yeah, I would, <laughs> I would agree. This is obviously a very broad question. Um, I would say yeah, it, it just it depends on on the city that you, you're looking at. Um, I think a city like LA and, and New York City, um, I feel like um, they're pretty well investigated. They, they have many NO2 monitors, and so um, it's going to take uh, I would say more effort to to kind of get an answer there than a than an area that has much less information. So I do think it varies on a, on a case by case basis. Um, yeah, especially if you don't have an NO2 monitor, then then something looking at tropomy directly uh, would be a very easy thing to do. But you know, a city like New York City or um, or LA that has so many monitors would be a little different. I guess I also want to highlight that I, the thing that I think is the best about satellite data is the near real time aspect of it is that you can get a, a nice regional picture in near real time. So um, you know if you want to know is is a monitor not calibrated correctly, you know, that's, um, you know, you could just take a look at, at NO2 and say, well, does, does tropomy show large amounts of NO2 in this location? If, if so, then maybe there's might be something wrong with the monitor, maybe something, you know, maybe there's a local source or something. So I think tropomy can be a good starting point, especially in your real time of trying to discern what's going on in areas, actually satellite data more broadly, but tropomy in particular for high resolution applications. And so maybe we have Alex others is... that want to add. Oh, go ahead, Tracy. No, no. If Alex or James wants to weigh in, I think they're. I also, I just wanted to say that I think it. I, I, uh, I, I don't know the best way to start this, but ultimately, I think it will come down to the question that you're trying to answer. Um, and if you, for instance, let's say you have one monitor, but it might be um, not represent. It's not representative of the entire city that you're trying to look at. So in that case, you need to start layering on different tools like TripoMe. Or on the converse, if you just have TripoMe overpasses, you might not really have a good idea of um, if there's a source coming in, you don't really know what it's contributing to the ground level because you just have the vertical column. And so I think you know, having one piece of the puzzle is a great starting point, but I do think there is value in getting a combination, especially when you start trying to dig in and, and understand what's going on um, at that monitor location or within, you know, the, the broader urban uh, center or um, across a rural area. So it's, it's valuable to think about the question as well as starting to layer on those different pieces. James, did you want to add to that one or? Sure, yeah, I'll just, as someone who's primarily a modeler and has been using the satellite data in the context of the model, I think that um, that, that acts actually really highlighted the value um, and kind of another way that the satellite adds value because, um, you know, the Listos campaign highlighted how you can apply the model um, over the city to learn a lot about the chemistry that's going on there. But running a model at that scale and getting the sort of input data you need is a huge lift and, and requires, a, you know, in most cases, like a team of people to do that. And, um, but with uh, something like, you know, Tracy pointed to tools where you can just go grab satellite data or Dan mentioned that, you know, they're gonna make shape files available. Um, that's like maybe one person with, with no experience could, could do that. And so I think that's a huge uh, advantage um, where certainly like models are, are really useful um, if you have the, the team and the resources to do that, the satellite data provides uh, is probably much more accessible. That's a good, a good follow up to that question. It is. Um, Actually, so I love all these answers. And, you know, we're all modelers here. 
But I just wanted to say, you know, I think one tool that we haven't talked about are reduced form models. And in particular, there's a model called InMAP, I-N-M-A-P, that was developed um, by Chris Tessum at the University of Illinois and Julian Marshall, who's now at uh, Washington and Jason Hill at, at Minnesota. But um, the InMAP model was developed specifically to support urban scale analysis across a wide area. So it has a variable resolution and it's, it is focused on PM 2.5, but it includes constituent um, compounds like nitrate. And I think it's well suited for um, urban scale questions. And so I think that, you know, as we're getting this portfolio, it's easy to say, like, if you're going to use a model, it should be the best available. But if you want to resolve urban scale issues, and most cities are not Chicago, New York, and Houston. I mean, and those cities have such high levels of technical expertise in a house that they're pretty well represented. But I mean, here in Madison, we're a city, you know, we're a, one of the fastest growing cities in uh, America and often voted a good place to live. So I really recommend people visit our Haycast meeting when we come here in October, but we do not have a single NO2 monitor. And so if you have a place like Madison, uh, it's just, it's too small. It's one grid box on, in CMAC. It has no monitor. So you have the satellite data. And I think a lot of cities are like Madison, like mid-sized cities where you need information, but don't have a dedicated, you know, sustainability technical support team. I think that was a really good wrap up there. That was a good one to that question. So, um, if there's, I'm going to take a minute to say, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A, or um, perhaps you could ask Jenny to unmute you in the chat or put the chat, question in the chat to everyone. Uh, but if not, I think there's one more question that, oh, good, we're, get, we're having another one from Marastu. And this is to Dan and James um, before your final, another question that you have out there that'll be to everyone, but this one's specific. What can you say about the uncertainties in satellite derived NO2 versus surface measurements? Mm, deadly. Yeah, I get this question a lot. Um, and so the kind of the, the standard answer to that is that annual and seasonal averages are gonna be better than, than daily. Um, in, in fact, I, I would say I mean, that's one of my figures did show that is that seasonal um, seasonal averages of tropomy do pretty well when correlating um, to the surface. And so that doesn't account for um, any like uh, systematic bias. So that's what James was talking about a little bit is that there's systematic biases in, in the algorithm, which are getting uh, smaller and smaller over time. But I think that the random errors, um, when you average over long time frames, uh, they get very, very small. Um, and it's, you know, some of my oversampled images of, of, um, of annual NO2, they match pretty closely to what we would expect NO2 to be. So um, it depends on the time scale. Yeah, I don't. Um, uh, yeah. I, I don't really have much to add to Dan's comment, but just that, you know, I don't know if the question was trying to get at um, trying to uh, estimate surface concentrations from the satellite versus just correlating the kind of total calm amount versus a surface measurement, but that um, there's a lot of um, challenges with trying to estimate a surface amount based on the satellite column. And so, um, like Dan mentioned, most of the NO2 is at the surface, but because we're only getting the total column, it's hard to, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of uncertainties there. Okay, so uh, we have eight minutes left in our session. So this is gonna be a bulleted answer. So just two minutes a piece. And the question is, uh, what is your best example of how your data or data that you know of was used to improve a decision? Do you have a quote from a stakeholder? Don't everybody jump at once. <laughs> 
That's yeah. I guess I'll have to look, I'll have to look back. But yeah, I, I'm in contact with a, with a lot of uh, with a lot of stakeholders. Um, I, yeah, I actually I can't answer this off the top of my head. Someone else can go first. <laughs> well, I guess I will say that everything is still in progress on our end, but the work that we're doing is helping um, to uh, really pinpoint and uh, identify the next set of emission sectors that are our um, kind of target audience of being able to uh, strive for reductions in the Northeast to affect um, uh, ozone concentrations and hopefully reduce them. Um, so some of the, all of our modeling work is kind of tailored around being able to um, support our states in making those decisions. Um, so I guess that's, uh, as the stakeholder representative, that's uh, kind of what we're, we're aiming for, but no, no direct quotes from anybody yet. Um, still, st again, still in the, the, uh, in the, in the works. That was awesome, Alex. Do we have the next taker? I, I, I'll go because I do have a good story, but, and we wrote about it in 2014 in an article in the EM, which is basically how the Colorado Department of uh, Health and Environmental Protection, or I'm not sure if that's exactly the name, but the Colorado Air Quality uh, Department, uh, Pat Reddy, who was a meteorologist there, had read a paper by Brian Duncan where he used OMI uh, formaldehyde to nitrogen ratios and to identify ozone sensitivity. And um, Pat realized that this would be a helpful way in the front range of Colorado to evaluate whether NOx controls or VOC controls would be more effective at uh, addressing the region's ozone problems. And this is a very, very common issue because many places have an ozone monitor but don't have an NO2 or a VOC monitor and, um, or both, which you would need to do a ratio. So, um, so satellites can see formaldehyde, which is an indicator of VOC reactivity, and they can see NO2 and most NOx is in the form of NO2. So this ratio has been, was used by Pat at a board meeting and to um, highlight the idea that ozone was probably NOx limited. You know, but I'll say that sort of the corollary there is that most decisions are not, you know, if you have the science, then you do the decision. I mean, maybe a weather forecast that says a tornado is coming will force you to go to the basement and get out of it. But most air quality uh, decision-making is done in a very political framework. And even if satellite data are a force moving in the direction, there are usually a, like human organizations that are pushing for change in one direction and human organizations that are pushing in the opposite direction. And so I think even in this case of Colorado, nobody would go to the mat and say that the reason why everybody decided to make Knox policy reductions uh, is because of some satellite image. But it's more that uh, there's a you know, democratic uh, air quality management system and satellite data is playing a role. That counts, Tracy, that's great. Oh, yeah. I mean, CMAC is a tool, everything you do to improve CMAC, you have change the decision or change the opportunity for one. Excellent. Does anyone else, uh, I don't know, uh, want to speak up? Dan? James? Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, that was a, a very good answer, Tracy. Um, yeah, I think that um, a lot of the stakeholders we're interacting with, um, they, I think they just, they just want the satellite data to add one additional piece. So, um, you know, they think that for example, during COVID, you know, they think that NO2 changed based on their, their, their monitors, but their monitors are say right in the city center or, um, or out in the more suburban areas. And so they wanna know how is, how is, are the changes across the entire urban area? And so the satellite data can help inform that. Um, I think it's just an, another, another tool to use to, to make you more confident in your decisions. So I think, I, I'm not, I don't want to speak for stakeholders, but I think it, it just adds one le extra layer um, when they have to make that decision. So I, like Tracy said, it's not, it's not, you know, that binary satellite data is changing from yes or no, it's just giving you a little bit more confidence. I love it. Everybody's thinking on their feet here. This is great. 
And uh, we've had, uh, we have 62 participants right now. We've had 62 to 78 uh, going back and forth. So this is a very well listened to uh, session. James, I don't know if you want to take the last minute and a half. Just uh, very briefly, you know, point to my colleagues at the EPA. Um, I know that they're doing a lot of work with satellite data and continuing to expand um, their capabilities within that agency. Um, so I don't know, no, no specific quotes or anything, but I just I, there's a lot of work going on there, uh, and a lot of folks there are involved with with HCAS. Well, I think that was excellent, and we are continuing it at 5:15, and I'm going to see if there's any last words from anyone else, and then we'll we'll. Uh, look forward to the flash talks if not and we'll call this an end so let me give it a minute does anybody have anything they want to add panelists or people in the audience in case uh you can't see the chat screen um, for attendees um uh -huh. paul miller our uh, executive director of nescom noted that there was another kind of rapid fire uh use of tropomy no2 to quickly identify uh, and uh, the New York City Urban Plume direction on certain high ozone days um, to identify why uh, some monitors were exceeding ozone standards and some weren't. Um, so that's another uh, real-time use of uh, tropomy. Excellent, near real-time response too. Thanks, Paul. And I did miss it. I had the chat right over it, the other chat, the question chat. Um, does anyone else uh, want to uh, end the session? I don't know, Jenny, if you had any final words, any direction, logistics, or final sure. words of wisdom? Yeah, okay. so I just, I wanna thank all the panelists for your wonderful presentations and discussion. I wanna thank Amber for doing a great job moderating and fielding the questions, getting people to speak up. And I wanna thank all the attendees uh, for your questions and for listening. It's really great to have um, a large group of people uh, here so we are you know, thrilled with uh, these sessions. Uh, coming up at uh, 5.15 Central Time, so in 15 minutes, we'll have the flash talks, uh, which are gonna cover a lot of different topics. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So I highly recommend you stick around for that. And that'll be in the, the same uh, meeting link for webinar room A, but I will uh, close it briefly. So, and then that'll be, that'll be it for today. We have a, another day of uh, talks tomorrow. And tomorrow we Thank start you so at much, 8 30 everybody. Central Time. 9 30. Thanks, Central everybody. Time. Oh, Thank sorry, you. Tracy. No, no, that's all right. Just, just reminding people that it's an earlier start time tomorrow at 9 30 Eastern, 8 30 uh, with the coffee, with the coffee time, which do we have a more secure link that Jenny wrote for coffee. And then we have a, a session starting. So the schedule's online and um, hope for another great day. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Dan and Alex and James, and thanks to all the participants. We really appreciate all your engagement. This has been a, a very successful virtual meeting um, in, my, in my experience, and I can't wait for tomorrow. I can't wait for the flash talks. That's what I can't wait for. <laughs> thanks okay. to everyone. Bye. Bye.